Good morning guys, welcome back out here in the patrol, out on the beach. Just thought I'd do a bit of a review of the car after six months, my unbiased opinion on um, what I think about the, the Nissan Patrol compared to its main rival being the Land Cruiser 200 and 300 in, um, in reality. So um, yeah. Let's get started with that. All right, so I guess let's start with the the main real talking point of the patrol, something that does really let it down, and that's its interior. Now, it looks miles better with that wood grain gone so definitely doing a wrap on the interior will make it feel like a, a much nicer place to be you know if we're talking straight out of the box straight off the um off the showroom floor um yeah the patrol's interior is definitely lacking and the land cruiser is um definitely a lot better um in the t higher spec models um, I suppose one of the biggest things going for the Patrol is the fact of its price and what you get at that price. With the Land Cruiser, the lower spec ones, which are you know, similar price to the Patrol, um, probably more than what the Patrol is, at sort of TI level, at that price, this car is a no-brainer. Like... The value for money with the Patrol compared to the Land Cruiser is just incredible. You need to spend over $100,000 at least to be able to get the same sort of technology and feeling in the car than what you do at the lower spec Land Cruiser. Now another unfortunate point is the fact that this screen is rather dated. It doesn't really have a lot of features, no Android Auto. No Apple CarPlay, you know, system's pretty dated. There's not a heap of sort of infotainment sort of stuff in there, like DAB, um, digital radio, um, you know, screen mirroring, that sort of thing. It's just the standard Bluetooth, connect to your phone, um, navigation, that sort of thing, like bare bones pretty well but that's not such a big deal like i don't personally mind it that much um connects to my phone plays my music um speakers aren't horrible um they're definitely not the worst i've ever heard in a vehicle they're they're decent um i'm sure the the bose system in the til is miles better um but i mean out of the box not too bad of course there's modifications and stuff you can do like doing a sound system, speakers, sub, you know, that sort of thing. But if we're talking straight out of the box, speakers in this aren't too bad. And in all honesty, the screen's all right. It does what it needs to do. And I think functionality has been a bit of a priority for Nissan rather than creature comforts. Um, as it's sort of shown throughout the whole car. Yeah, you know, infotainment, eh, it's all right. I'm not a massive fan, but it doesn't bug me to the point where I'm like, I need to go and spend a couple of grand to go and replace this whole thing. Um, I will eventually, but for the meantime, it's doing what it is meant to do. Rightio, so moving down. I do like this system, although it's a little bit dangerous, I suppose. Um, in the sense where in some cars... A dial down here does stuff up here, and this dial, you know, typically isn't here that does the stuff on the screen. Now, a lot of people can get into the trap of thinking that this is, you know, meant to be doing something. Like, I know a lot of BMWs, um, what else, Mercedes, um, them sort of cars have moved to something like this to um, change options and stuff on the infotainment system. Um, Mazda does it as well. And it did catch me out once because I was used to driving my wife's car, which is a Mazda, um, whilst I was waiting for this to come. And 
was driving along and I'm trying to change something on the screen and I actually accidentally go into full high. That was no dramas, but definitely something to keep an eye on. And once you get used to the car, it's pretty obvious. Now, I like all these modes. I like that technology. Um, you can feel the difference between them all and how the throttle response is and I'm assuming how the transmission changes as well. Is it really necessary? Uh, probably not. If I knew more about what it actually did, then perhaps that would change my opinion, but from what I've noticed, it just changes the throttle response and most likely changes how the ch transmission will shift. Now, I always drive in manual, um, so it's not something that I really have to worry about anyway. Now, this big area of storage here, I mean, I sort of feel like it's a bit of a waste like this little thing here doesn't really hold much this is sort of wasted i mean this is perfect size for smaller cans and you know chewing gum coin slots here i mean it's sort of wasted like who's gonna fill that up with coins i think it's a little bit silly 12 volt 12 volt outlet there which i don't really see why because you've also got one here something i do like though is this panel i think that's quite a good idea I think it's in a good spot too for, for your switches, um, UHF, um, you know, pass through for your XRS connects, whatever, something like that. Disregard this, the sun has absolutely destroyed it and now it looks shit, so I'm going to have to fix that again. So yeah, I do like this. I think this is a good idea um, when you can, you know, have that modularity and be able to change things for yourself. I do like that. Handbrake down here, I don't like that. I think that's dumb. Um, it's just in an inconvenient spot. Sometimes you forget about it, you know. It's just a bit stupid. Perhaps this panel here could have been changed with having an electric um, handbrake because, I mean, not really many vehicles these days are going for the traditional style handbrake. It's all moving to something like this or, you know, electric handbrake. Um, which I would have much preferred, but anyway, it is what it is. Now, these cars haven't changed a whole heap since they came out in 2012 or 2013 or whatever it was with the Series 1. Um, obviously, this is a Series 5, and a few little changes have happened. Obviously, we've had a massive change from the live axle suspension in the first sort of generation, and then moving into this HBMC system, which I'll get into later. A few visual changes and that sort of thing, which has definitely made them look more modern. And I definitely like the look of the Series 5 compared to the other ones. It just looks so much more aggressive and nicer on the road. So I definitely like that. Also like the inclusion of all this leather stuff. It definitely makes the car feel a lot more premium. Um, even though it's coupled with the stupid wood grain. The pleated leather sort of go on the doors here i'm not sure what that's all about but i suppose it sort of would probably look better than just having flat you know leather there perhaps i'm not sure um but the armrests on the doors are extremely comfortable really soft so that's nice for for long driving so that's not too bad it's sort of stepping out of the car now bit of mud go through a bit of a bog hole to get here but it's all part of the fun seats aren't too bad although i'm not really a fan I haven't been able to find a comfortable driving position in this thing yet. Even after six months, I still haven't found a good driving position that I sort of really like. Um, did a big trip down to Victoria to see my parents, um, and that was sort of really the, the time where I found uh, a decent driving position. And typically I'd be feeling pretty buggered after big, like, 12-hour days of driving and, and whatnot. Um, but I didn't feel too bad, even though I wasn't exactly comfortable. Um, I just find that the bolstering isn't enough on the sides. I'd really like to see that push in a bit more and hug you into the car. I feel like it's such a massive seat that I can't really sit in it comfortably because I feel like I'm sort of sliding around a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if other people have found that because it's not really something that I hear people talk about too much. But I find that, yeah, the seating situation isn't the best. And if there was aftermarket seats that offered more bolstering, but a similar sort of look. Uh, regardless, they are, you know, comfortable. Don't get me wrong. Like, they're nice and soft and 
Um, they do feel nice to sit in, but I just would prefer a bit more bolstering and perhaps a bit more, um, I don't know, seat adjustment. Um, because, yeah, I just don't feel like they're um, com as comfortable as they should be, I suppose. Um, you do sit up rather high in the patrol, but I, I feel like that's a bit of a, a positive. You can see out of the vehicle really well. Like, like the view out of the car is really good. You can see everything. Um, you're not really obstructed by much. And you definitely get a good appreciation of where you are on the road. Um, so that's also very important. Look, interior of the car, it's not bad. You need to do a few things to make it a nicer place to be. But that's another point that I'd like to bring up. I think there's a bit of a misconception that you know a car's going to be perfect straight off the showroom a car manufacturer cannot create a vehicle that is going to suit everyone perfectly with their needs all right so they need to make a vehicle that's going to be reliable fuel efficient you know fairly comfortable have decent technology in it be safe and you know not break pretty much they can't design a car specifically for towing for four wheel driving for you know handling really well you know, there's going to be compromises, and I think that's something that a lot of people need to understand is the fact that, you know, you, if you're going to buy something, you need to really think, right, what am I going to be doing with this car? You know, what are my goals for the car? And if you're going to be towing, well, you're going to be spending money on suspension and, you know, perhaps a bit of um, engine stuff like exhaust, snorkel, um, you know, coolers, that sort of thing to ensure that your vehicle can safely and reliably tow. It's just the fact of things. These cars will tow three and a half ton, straight out of the box. You know, no dramas. Well, when I say no dramas, you know, it's not ideal. So the rear of the car will sag. It's just the nature of the beast. So with this HBMC system, what it stands for is hydraulic body motion control. So basically they've done away with sway bars and they've used this hydraulic suspension system to be able to adjust how the car rides on the fly. The body roll isn't as bad as you would expect. Yes, it definitely has it, but this is like a 2.8 ton car. Yeah, it's gonna wanna roll in corners. It's just how it goes. You know, every massive car like this is going to. In conjunction with that, it has coil springs, no leaves, no nothing like that. So it's a coil sprung vehicle, all independent suspension and one of the features of that is they do like to sag um, when loaded up um, just because of the geometry of the suspension, it's just how it is. So that's something to keep in mind when you're buying a vehicle to tow, see what the suspension's like and what aftermarket um, products there are uh, that will help you in towing. For the patrols, a uh, very popular upgrade is to do a, um, airbags are great because they they sort of help um, keep your spring um, not as loaded up and not sag as much as what it would without airbags. So basically, pump them up with air to a desired pressure and they'll help keep the uh, rear of the car more level. But in saying that, the patrols are a great tow vehicle. I mean, they've got a good drivetrain. Like, tail shaft in this thing is enormous. It is huge, and it needs to be. So these are a very popular choice uh, when it comes to towing. You see them towing quite often, um, and you can tell who's actually upgraded their car and who hasn't. Um, I've seen patrols sagging in the ass, dragging trailers along. Um, and then I've seen them sit level as and, you know, be charging down the road. So, um, like I was saying, you definitely need to upgrade the vehicle, regardless of what it is, to be able to do what you want it to do. So this thing is a VK56. Very good engine. I love this thing. It sounds great. And it has plenty of power. Great for towing. It's a really nice engine and surprisingly, it's not as thirsty as you would think. Especially coupled with that 140 litre tank, which definitely comes in handy for longer trips. Um, yeah, it's, it's not even that bad. Around town, I'm getting about 14.4 litres per hundred, um, if not a little bit more than that. But that's basically around where it'll sit. And I mean, it's happy as... 100k, 7th gear, and it's just happy to purr along all day. Now something that 
I think is a um, good thing to think about when you are going to purchase a new car is does it have some sort of motorsport pedigree or some sort of competition pedigree, something. Now, the reason I say that is a racing team or a competitive team isn't going to choose a vehicle for no reason, all right? We'll talk about V8 supercars, for example. Now, when Nissan raced the Nissan Altima in the V8 supercars uh, for a couple years, uh, a few years back, this was the engine that they chose. Um, obviously, teams need to choose an engine from their manufacturer. Um, so, with the new Gen 3 cars, with the Camaro and the Mustang, obviously using engines from the manufacturer, because that's how it works. That's how racing works. So, Nissan, the Nissan teams obviously chose the VK56, because that was a V8 that Nissan were producing. They, Nissan wouldn't have spent all that money developing all that stuff for no reason, if the engine was shit. If that engine, the VK56, can race around Mount Panorama all weekend and have no dramas, then why would it have a drama in your car being detuned and de-stressed unlike a race engine? Obviously, there's a lot of differences between this production engine and the stuff that goes in, you know, V8 supercars. But in saying that, this is the base for that engine. So the block um, is for that racing application. Obviously, there's a lot that's been changed, like air intake systems, valves, cams, all the rest of it, um, to make it a competitive race car. But nonetheless, this is what they used. These engines are extremely reliable in the patrol. Um, I haven't heard of many things go wrong. Obviously, maintenance is the key to having a good anything. On the earlier patrols, uh, I think it was series one to three or one to two, they were having timing chain issues, um, which, I mean, is fairly common in timing chain V8s in general. Um, the old BA, BF, um, FG, uh, Boss 260s to 290s, they would have timing chain issues too. They would stretch and um, you know that have to be replaced every 150,000 k's or 100,000 k's or whatever um, to ensure that you know you don't explode your engine. Now they seem to have fixed that issue um, from series 3 onwards so I mean I haven't really heard of these engines going wrong. Um, obviously maintenance like I said is key for um, keeping anything in good condition um, so, you know, obviously that's going to be a big thing, maintaining a good, healthy life of your car. Now, these are really do prefer to be ran on 98, although they will run on 91, although I wouldn't. Um, I've had to use 95 just because that's all a servo had, um, in the middle of nowhere, so a bit unfortunate, but it is what it is. But apart from that, I'll always run 98 in this engine. I believe that it's a much better fuel and you can notice a massive difference in the performance of the car. So, look, there's not a heap of room in the engine bay, but I mean, I don't really know what else you really want to put in here. Of course, you could put a dual battery system, but I mean, there's plenty of great stuff nowadays um, that goes in the rear of the car, so. Now, something that I sort of noticed was um, the fact that the 300 series looks extremely similar to the Y62. Very similar. If you look at the rear of both vehicles, I'll put it up on the screen now, they look extremely similar. Um, the front of the car is similar, although you, you can definitely see a difference, um, but very similar in design. And obviously the Patrol come first, and then it was the 300. Um, so, you know, Toyota, what's going on? You're sort of alluding to the, the fact that the Patrol looks much better. I'm not saying that Toyota's copying Nissan here, but... Um, I mean, the styling, I don't know. Something's going on there. Let's talk about the rear sort of passenger area of the Patrol. Of course, it's locked. So the rear of the Patrol is huge. There is so much space in the back of this car, and it's a very comfortable place to be. You have miles of leg room. Like, that's my driving position there, and you can see just how much leg room there is available for passengers. You know, look at that. 
So it's a very spacious car. You definitely feel like you're in a large space when you're driving. Like you have to reach for, you know, controls on the dash um, just because of how large the vehicle is. Although it doesn't really feel it when you drive it, like I mentioned before. So the interior space is great. I really do like this. And it's something that Land Cruiser sort of doesn't compare with the Patrol in. Um, Land Cruiser is a bit smaller, a bit more cramped on the inside. Um, so the space in this is great. So yeah, definitely really like the Patrol for this. Great for passengers. Um, again, sort of a basic sort of bin design here with controls for the rear aircon, uh, tri-zone, um, and USB chargers as well. Obviously, TIL has screens in here, um, and I mean, if you're going to be buying a car, you sort of need to think what you are going to do with it. For me, having headrest screens wasn't really a big deal for me. I didn't really want the TIL, as it's a bit too flashy. I wanted a four-wheel drive, and um, I think the TI does that um, a lot better in the fact that it doesn't have all that flashy stuff to go wrong, so that's why I chose this. Um, and I feel like the Land Cruisers are a bit, bit poxy in the fact that there's just so much going on and massive screens and heap more tech and that sort of thing, which you may be into. But for me, I'm happy with a sort of agricultural sort of feel. I want it to be a four-wheel drive and it's going to get dinted and scratched. And that's okay by me. And full of tech and stuff that can go wrong. I just want something a bit basic that does everything that I need it to do uh, to be a good four-wheel drive. For the rear of the car, there is so much space in here. It is really good. Um, obviously, with the uh, third row seats up sort of issue uh, with space, then um, yeah, you sort of only have this sort of little section here. Um, but still, you know, it's enough for some luggage and stuff, but, um, I feel if you're going to be having, you know, eight seats, perhaps a patrol isn't really the car for you. Um, perhaps, you know, you should look at a people mover or something like that. Um, cause you're going to fit small people in the rear. I mean, I don't really know a car that, that is like this, that has good third row space. It's not horrible. You know, you could fit an adult in here or a couple of adults in the very back for a short trip, but it would probably get very uncomfortable for a long trip. Now, we've got 12 volt in the rear, which is nice. Um, sort of, that's about it. You've got a bit of storage under here with your jack and that sort of thing. It's not huge. Um, but again, if you're going to be touring and camping, that sort of thing, you're going to change this out anyway. So, I mean, it's not so much of a big deal. I don't like the fact that these seats don't go down flat. That's pretty annoying. Um, but if you do lower this second seat here, obviously I can't got child seat in, but if you lower this again, then you have like so much room in this car. It is just incredible. You know, if you were just a couple and you like to go touring, camping, that sort of thing, you could remove these rear seats, all of them, all four, and you could chuck in a drawer system here, nice false floor, get your 12 volt set up. And, you know, this thing would be the ultimate tourer. Or, you know, chop it and have an awesome ute. So, yeah, rear of the car is good. It's got more space than the Land Cruiser does. So, that's a positive. If you need more off-the-shelf sort of space, then, then this is something you'd be looking at. Um, obviously, it's got cup holders in the rear, which I think is sort of... It's nice to have, but I think it's a bit of a waste of space. Um, definitely could have had something else there. Um, to sort of fill that in um, but again this is not catering for camping people and all the rest of it now this apparently you can run a fridge off this um, if it has too much drawer it'll obviously trip the fuse uh, but people have ran fridges off them like decent size ones nothing crazy you could definitely put like a you know 25 50 litre fridge in the back here um, maybe a little bit bigger and um, it'd be okay, uh, but definitely smaller fridges is, is probably best for this if that's really what you have to do. Um, I haven't tried it, I'm probably not going to, I prefer not to um, to do that. Um, but there's some great 12 volt options for batteries and that sort of thing, so that's also nice. 
um, the um, aftermarket um, accessories and stuff you can get for these cars now is great. Um, big long lithium batteries that'll go in this space here, which gives you you know a lot of space to do what you will with. Um, that's not being taken up by batteries. These panels will come off and you can put your air compressors and stuff in there. Um, put panels here for light switches and all the rest of it. So that's that's also good. Something I'm not so much of a fan of is the fact that, disregard the missing clips, I do have them, I just haven't put them in. I don't like the fact that the tailgate is like this. I like the old barn doors where, you know, open up one side, open up the other side, you have access in. Um, if you're in tight shopping centres or low car parks, that sort of thing, this is sort of an issue. Um, you know, especially if you have to back right up to fit into a car spot because these are so huge. Um, how are you going to get the boot open if you need to load your groceries in? I think that's a bit of an issue that new cars are doing these days. I'd much prefer, prefer to see barn doors that don't take as much room up to open. Um, so, yeah, just something to be mindful of when you are going shopping or doing whatever you know it's not it's not a deal breaker you just obviously have to be a bit more cautious of of where you park something else the patrol does well is they have more ground clearance departure and approach angle than the land cruiser you can sort of see that nissan has had some thought about its four driving um you know community um the fact that stock they have um better uh, approach departure and ground clearance it is by a few mils. Um, the ground clearance is considerably higher though. Um, but you know, the, those few centimeters and mils and whatnot can definitely be very beneficial um, in some situations. So if you're sort of wanting stock four driving capability, um, then this is definitely something that you're gonna wanna um, look at with the patrol. Obviously, TIL with that front bar, it sits down a lot lower because it's got that spoiler, little splitter lip on it. Um, so that's something to definitely be um, cautious of with a TIL. That's definitely more so your luxury um, towing vehicle, um, I, I believe. Obviously, the spare wheel's mounted under the car as well. Um, so it sort of can get in the way if you're, you know, doing rocks rock steps and crazy stuff like that. Um, but if you're into that sort of thing, you're gonna replace the rear bar with a um, with a rear bar from, you know, Razzler or something like that and have your um, wheel mounted on the rear of the car. But that also brings its own issues. You know, that's putting a lot of weight on the rear of the car and then you wanna upgrade your springs to have your springs and uh, the list just goes on and on and on. So how these springs are set up already, um, you know, you don't have a lot of wiggle room for accessories. So that's definitely something to be um, to be cautious of as well if you're going to start uh, modifying the vehicle. Springs is probably going to be one of the first things that you do. So then you can just chuck on what you want and not have to worry about it. Alright, so have I had any issues with the patrol? Um, a couple, you know, fairly minor ones. Um, nothing crazy. Uh, so I picked this car up on a Thursday and then took it for driving on the Friday and then Saturday. Um, and doing some, you know, reasonably difficult tracks for a stock vehicle. Um, got to a bit of a, a climb that was very shaly. Um, and I had no drive to the front, front wheels. So I thought, oh, yeah, okay, a little bit strange. Um, we'll keep going and see how it, how it um, sort of pans out. Got to this really simple, easy spot that I was really surprised I got stuck at. It was a little bit of a step that went up, a little bit of, you know, shaly sort of ground. And then it sort of went up again. There's a few little divots um, in the ground. Nothing, nothing crazy at all. And couldn't get up it. Um, the front was trying to climb and the rear was trying to climb at the same time. So it's not an ideal situation. Um, but yeah, I could not climb it. So that's sort of when we figured, right, there's something going on with a four drive system. And I sort of figured because the car has literally just come off the ship and it's been, you know, sitting at Nissan doing whatever, perhaps they've forgotten to, to do something with the car to get it out of that sort of shipping state, whatever it is that they do, pull the 
fused out or something. So basically we had a look around, um, nothing blue, nothing was odd, um, everything looked fine. Pulled both uh, four-wheel drive fuses out, the one that sits under here and the one in the bonnet, uh, in the engine bay, sorry, as well. And um, after that, four-wheel drive started working again, so it must have just been a computer sort of reset or something that it did to, um, yeah, to, to sort that out. Because it's obviously been working fine ever since, otherwise I would be bogged. Actually, I've never been bogged in this. Have not been bogged in this yet, even in its stock state. I mean, I haven't done hard stuff. I've done some challenging things, but it hasn't stopped. So, touch wood. That's good. So, the other issue I had was the air con line. That was sort of a bit of a bigger deal. Luckily, we had that cold snap up here in Queensland, and it wasn't hot, so I didn't really have to use it. Uh, but that was a bit disappointing. So basically what happened there, the aircon lines are meant to sit in this little bracket. So the lines pop into the bracket and it keeps them um, sitting in a position where they're not going to interfere with anything. So somehow that either wasn't in its bracket to begin with or it had popped out from um, driving off-road or something like that. I'm unsure how it happened. Um, I never really looked at it, never paid any attention to it. Wasn't something that I was even, you know, thinking about. So Nissan came to the party on that one. Uh, they replaced that and that's all good. It's back in its mount now. And it's definitely something I'll always keep an eye on because it's not an ideal situation to be in with no aircon. So yeah, those two things are the only issues that I've had. And, you know, you, I don't really read about too many things going wrong with the car. Alignments are a big thing. Also, tyre choice does play a big part in it as well. Um, there's some tyres that the patrols just absolutely hate, and there's some that they love. So, yeah, definitely something to um, to be thinking about if you're going to be upgrading tyres. Do your research in that as, as um, before you buy anything for sure. Now, overall, would I buy a Land Cruiser or this? I've always been a Nissan fan. I've always liked Nissan. I suppose I've sort of always liked the underdog brand of car. And I feel that that's the same with Nissan and Land Cruiser. Land Cruiser's always been the thing. Oh, they're the most reliable. They're the best four-wheel drive that money can buy. I feel now it's starting to become a bit of an opposite. I feel like the Patrol, the Y62, is these days the better car to buy. Price coupled with wait times... Like, you probably can't even get a 300 series within minimum six months. I'm guessing it's probably a 12-month 12 12 month wait for the Land Cruiser 300 series. Whereas Nissan has been having record um, numbers of cars purchased for like, I don't know, like nearly four or six months straight now. Um, I think last month they sold 3,000 in a month. Um, and I mean... Toyota can't keep up with demand and to be honest I don't know who is spending over $100,000 on a car that isn't as good as a Patrol if we're talking value for money, Patrol hands down wins, if we're talking about interior design and functionality of interior and technology yeah Land Cruiser is going to have it you know, this hasn't been changed for since it's come out, really. The overseas models have had updates and their interiors look schmick. But for us here in Australia, we get this POV pack of an interior with a CD player, for goodness sake. Like, who uses CDs nowadays? I mean, if you did, well, that's great, but... You know, you can put CDs onto a USB, put it in the USB stick, and away you go. You know, if you really wanted to listen to your music that way. Everything these days is getting more technical and, you know, mirroring your phone to your screen and doing stuff like that. It's becoming a big thing and that's definitely letting the patrol down. But like I said, that value for money, what you get in the patrol is miles better than the Land Cruiser. So if I was to buy another car, it'd be a patrol hands down. I think the patrol, from what I've seen in tests, does better off-road just with its ground clearance and its departure and approach angles. I think the engine is also another big selling point, having that V8. Uh, Land Cruisers, the 300 series doesn't have a V8 anymore. Um, and that's why 200 series are asking over $100,000 still, you know, if not more. And it's just ridiculous when you can buy a brand new TIA or TIL for under 100000 depending on what dealer you go to. I mean, 
it's really a no-brainer. And that brings me back to my point before. You know, no car is going to do what you want it to do from the factory. It's going to need to have money spent to be able to comfortably and reliably do the things that you want it to do. If you set your car up to four-wheel drive, it'll be good at four-wheel driving. If you want it to tow, it'll be good at towing. Touring, well, you know, it's going to be a good touring vehicle. It's going to be comfortable and have everything that you need in it. Doing your research before you buy the car that you want and seeing what aftermarket capabilities in the way of upgrades and what you want to do with it should determine what you buy. I think the debate between Toyota and Nissan, I think it's talk, chalk and cheese in these newer vehicles just for the fact of cost and value for money and what you get in the car. So, in my opinion... This is the better car to buy in today's market simply for the fact of what you get for your $90,000 that you're going to spend. After six months, yeah, there's a few things that I would change, a few things I don't like, but you get used to it, you live with it, you find ways around it, and, you know, it doesn't turn out to be that bad. So, guys, I hope you've found this interesting, and perhaps it'll start a bit of conversation about uh, what your thoughts are which I'd love to hear down below. This is just my opinion and experience with the car. Obviously, others will vary. Discussion and opinion is the best way of learning. So, if you've got a different opinion, let me know about it. I'd like to know what your thoughts are and what your reasoning is. So, thanks for watching, guys. Much appreciated. Make sure you subscribe, like this video, and comment your opinions down below. Helps out greatly. And stay tuned because we've got the snorkel coming in the next couple of weeks. So we're going to install that and um, get an instructional video out on how to do that. Because like I always say, working on your car is the most rewarding and cost-saving thing that you can do. So thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one.